Hello everyone. Change of scene. I'm visiting my sister and so I, uh, I'm in a different setting but uh, very glad to be with you again. Uh, today is the 26th of March and uh, um, I wanted to do something about Easter but I'm not able to do what I wanted because I don't have all the, being away from home, I don't have all the things that I need to to refer to my notes and so on. So I decided to do something completely different instead and as a matter of fact absolutely completely different. Um, because I'm thinking at this time in Easter about uh, not only what we are commemorating but also where the world is today and the um, the fact that uh, a lot of it, in my opinion at any rate, is due to the lack of, um, well, disbelief in God, lack of uh, moral and ethical uh, understanding and behavior. And uh, I was thinking uh, about this and so the opposite of it is what we are all suffering and enduring seeing things that uh, we shouldn't be seeing in the sense of uh, total moral depravity and de degeneracy in many aspects and how how did we get i was thinking how do how did our leaders and leaders of government and of countries get to this point um, in the past we could see that it was perhaps due to absolute power and the, um, uh, you know, the abuse of that power. Do our leaders have that absolute power? Well, in theory they don't. But they have gotten to a point, I would argue, where it is as if they were not accountable for what they do. And... Um, I believe that when you are not accountable then moral degeneracy and decadence start and then it ends up in total moral degeneracy and you know what I thought of? I said who can I talk about? Who can I as an example of where um, lack of responsibility and lack of accountability leading to moral decadence, moral degeneracy, ending practically in insanity. And I thought of Nero. <laughs> and I'm going to take you through his um, degeneracy, as it were, to the point of madness practically at the end. And I'm going to use the historian Suetonius. Suetonius, um, writing in the first century, he wrote a book the, well, he wrote many books. One of them, the one I have here, is the the Twelve Caesars, and he talks about each one of them. He was practically a contemporary. He's writing in the first century, okay? Uh, Nero uh, was born in the year 37 um, AD. Um, so uh, this is the translate. I'm using the translation by uh, Robert Graves. So let me just start quickly. I, um, Nero uh, was a, of a fairly average height with a postular and maladorious body, body and blondish hair. His face was pretty rather than handsome, his eyes blue-grey and rather weak. He had a squat neck, a protuberant belly and uh, sickly thin legs. His health was amazingly good, though, for all the extravagant, uh, the extravagant indulgences um, in his life. He had only three illnesses in 14 years, and none of them serious enough to stop him uh, drinking wine. Or, um, anyway, <laughs> so um, he. Uh, did not actually uh, trouble to dress in the appropriate uh, fashion, but always had his hair set in rows and curls, and in, in, in curly rows, I mean. And when he visited another, another city, Achaia, he let it actually grow long and hang down all the way down his back. 
He often appeared in public wearing a, an unbelted silk dressing gown and slippers with a scarf tied around his neck. As a boy, Nero studied most of the, um, the usual subjects except philosophy because his mother Agrippina said that uh, that was not proper study for a future ruler. Um, he turned to poetry and he was not bad at it um, and he, he was able to write quite, a, quite dash off verses without, without much effort as a matter of fact. It is often claimed that uh, he published other people's works as his song but not in, 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 in uh, poetry. As a child uh, there are notebooks and loose pages that uh, have come into my possession, says the historian Suetonius. They have come, I have seen them, they have come into my possession, which contain some of Nero's best known poems in his own handwriting. And you can see that it is, that he's not a copy or he has not been dictated because there are crossing outs and, and um, changing words and so on. So it looks as if he was actually actually, you know, thinking things out for himself. He, old, he also had a, a developing an interest in painting and sculpture. His greatest um, weakness um, were, it was due, it started with his thirst um, for popularity and his jealousy of men who caught the public eye by any means whatsoever. They could be a gladiator, they could be a singer. He couldn't allow anyone to be better than himself. We are going to study that, or go, go through it a little bit. Um, so, um, for example, he, he, could, <laughs> he could play the lyre and he could sing, but um, he would make sure that he won all the prizes at the end and then he would go and kill the singers and the actors because they were he considered them better than 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 he was um, so let me then go back to the very beginning this is sort of a general introduction to to give you an idea of, of who he was but he was uh, okay so he was born in the uh, in on the 15th of december in the year 37 AD. Um, the sun was rising, the, the, you know, we are here with omens and things. The sun was rising and its earliest rays touched the newly born boy almost before he could be laid down on the ground. Now, a child, when a child was born, he had to be laid first on the ground and then his father would pick him up, acknowledge him as his son. Okay, and from that moment, there he was acknowledged and, and, um, and, that, and, and he did that by lifting him up. Well, apparently, um, he was, uh, what, what, what does the book say? Uh, but, the sun was rising and its earliest rays touched the newly born boy almost before he could be laid on the ground. All right. At the age of three, uh, Nero uh, lost his father and with that his inheritance. Uh, because although he was entitled, of course, to... Um, to one third of the state, his then his stepfather took it all for himself and banished his mother or his wife Agrippina banished her away. So it was only much later, with the change of emperors, that he was able to recover her, his wealth uh, and his mother uh, called back. All right. Now, Nero. Um, celebrated uh, his formal introduction into public life by giving a, by that time he was wealthy, by giving a, a largesse uh, to the people and a bounty, a bounty to the troops and leading a ceremonial parade of the Praetorians, shield in hand. 
Afterwards, in the Senate, he made a speech of thanks to Claudius, the, the emperor. Then, he, uh, soon after, he married uh, Octavia and held games and wild beast hunts in the circus on behalf of Claudius' good health. So, he had by now reached the age of 16 when the news of Claudius' death, he was going to inherit, uh, he was going now to become emperor. Uh, he was 16 when Claudius died and he presented himself without further ado uh, to the uh, to the Praetorian guards and uh, um, and then he uh, to the Senate I mean he just took it for granted off he went okay um, Nero started off very well praising uh, the last Emperor Claudius and having a, a huge fun funeral and then he as he became Emperor he actually lost a lot of interest and left the management of official and private affairs to his mother, Agrippina. Um, let's see. As a further guarantee of his virtuous intentions of how he was going to rule, he promised to model his rule on the principles laid down by Augustus and never missed an opportunity of being generous or merciful or of showing what a great companion he was. He even lowered taxes for the people. If, however, we're beginning to see little things here, if asked to, to sign the usual execution order for a felon, he would sigh, Oh, how I wish that I had never learned to write. All right. He seldom forgot a face. He could remember your name and uh, your, your, your face and your name and who you were with no problem, without a moment's hesitation. Um, once when the Senate passed the vote of thanks to him, he answered, uh, wait until I have deserved the praise. Fine, that is all right. Okay, so he then started um, giving an immense variety of, uh, of entertainments, youth games, chariot races in the circus, stage plays, uh, gladiatorial shows, and he would persuade and even insist sometimes that even old men of consular rank took play to took um, took tr um, part in these youthful games and also older women so it was beginning to be a little bit odd okay um he was the first to establish in rome a festival of uh, competitions in music athletics and horsemanship model on the Greek ones and these were held every four years and he called them, uh, changed the name of Olympian and he called them Neur Neronia. <laughs> um, all right, so beginning to see a little bit. He also introduced his own new, uh, new style of architecture with lots of porches uh, during his reign, a great many public abuses that were actually suppressed by the imposition of heavy penalties. And um, he tried to control how people, started trying to control how people spent their money, not allowing this or that, what foods they could uh, eat, what foods they could buy. Uh, we're beginning to see a little bit of... Um, odd things. Um, he felt no ambition to extend the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, he uh, considered withdrawing his troops from Britain, as a matter of fact, but he never did because he thought that uh, it would deflect uh, on the, the glory of, uh, of his adoptive father, Claudius, the last emperor. He came to the throne because he, he was his adopted son. Music. Now, music formed uh, part of, uh, of his childhood curriculum, and uh, and, and he, he developed a taste uh, for it uh, very early on. He wasn't bad at it. 
Soon after his accession to the throne, he uh, brought the greatest lyre player of the day to sing to him when dinner had ended for several nights on a row, and he would uh, he would have to play for 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 a long, long time every night. Um, Okay, but uh, little by little, he actually started playing, uh, wanted to learn how to play himself. Little by little, started practicing, and uh, he actually was quite conscientious to undertake all the usual exercises, also for singing, for developing and strengthening the voice. And he would actually lie on his back with a slab uh, of, of uh, lead on, the, on his chest, and uh, use um, enemas and emetics to to, uh, to 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 keep down his weight, refrain from eating apples and every other food that he considered uh, bad for the vocal cords. Um, ultimately, he actually achieved quite a little bit of success. His voice was still feeble and husky, but he was pleased enough with his progress and uh, it started nurturing um, or nursing perhaps uh, acting um, the theater ambitions uh, performance he loved that um, he then started entering competitions he wasted no time in getting his name entered on the list of competing liar play uh, liar players and dropped his ticket into the urn with the others for, to be to be part of the competition the praetorian prefects carried his liar as he went up to play and a group of military tribunes and close friends accompanied him also <coughs> Excuse me. After taking his place and briefly begging the audience uh, their kind attention, he announced through um, a cons a person of consular rank that he was going to sing Niobe. Niobe was uh, it's 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 part of obviously of uh, Greek literature. Niobe is. Um, um, she had seven sons and seven daughters, and uh, she actually boasted that she was superior to the goddess uh, Leto, who was the mother of Apollo and Artemis. And in retaliation for that, the goddess uh, let her children um, kill all of Naobi's children. And then in the tragedy, there is there a lament, Naobi's lament. Uh, probably uh, this is what Nero was performing, uh, Naobi's uh, lament. It says in the, in the, in the mythology um, uh, story that uh, when all of her children were killed, by Leto's, uh, by Apollo and Artemis, that in deep anguish she ran to Mount Spilus, and there she pleaded with the gods to put an end to her pain. And Zeus, the god, of, the the god of gods, took pity on her and turned her into a rock, so that to make her feelings of stone. Uh, that is the the, the mythology uh, tale, and probably what Nero was performing here was her lament. Um, <clears throat> okay, he also performed um, among his performances. I read here were Kanaki in childbirth, Orestes the matricide, Oedipus blinded and Hercules ravings. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about each one of them. Okay, the first one, um, Kanaki or Kanachi, C-A-N-A-C-E, okay, in childbirth. Um, in the mythology tale, she had been impregnated by her brother. Uh, when she gave birth, the affair came to light and both she and her brother committed suicide. 
In the case of the other that uh, Nero also loved performing was Orestes. And Orestes Hill killed his mother to avenge uh, her murder of his father, her husband, Agamemnon. Um, Oedipus, of course, blinded himself after discovering that he had unknowingly, he didn't know, killed his father and married his mother. And Hercules was driven mad, actually, by the goddess Hera, that is um, uh, um, Zeus' wife. Um, uh, the goddess actually killed his uh, he actually killed in he went mad okay and he killed his wife and children so we see we beginning to see that nero is fascinated with all these stories of incest and and murder of relatives especially okay which are going to reflect his own life story um Horses also had been Nero's main interest since childhood. Whatever his tutors might do, they could never stop his chatter about the chariot races at the circus. Uh, very soon, Nero set his heart on driving a chariot himself in a regular race. And after a preliminary trial in the palace gardens before an uh, audience of slaves and uh, the, the slaves and the, and the hoi polloi, <laughs> the, the people, he made a public appearance finally at the circus uh, Maximus. Okay. Um, the cities uh, which uh, regularly um, sponsored musical context had adopted the, pra the practice of sending him every available prize for lyre playing. He always accepted this, all the prizes, with uh, great pleasure, giving the delegates the earliest audience of the day, an invitation to private dinners. It was extremely important to him to win, to be given the prize for fir being first in all this performance. Go, go and figure. But anyway... Um, they uh, they would beg Nero when he was invited after giving the prizes and you know all the flatterers and being invited to his private parties. They would beg Nero to sing again and again when the meal was over and um, applaud his performance over and over again. Um, he ordered these contests, uh, which normally took place uh, at uh, long intervals, to be held during his visit. Whenever, whenever he went anywhere in any city, they would have all these competitions and, and uh, contests. Uh, anyway, so, and he would obviously always <laughs> win the prize. Um, oh, uh, yes, he... Let me see here a story. Um, even if it meant repeating them again and again, and broke the tradition at Olympia by introducing a musical competition into the athletic games. When his freedman Helios advised him that he was urgently needed at Rome, in, 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 the middle of, uh, in the middle of all these competitions. He would not be distracted by official businesses. Uh, but he actually wrote back, yes, you have made yourself quite plain. The, the freedman was insisting that he come to Rome. Yes, you have made yourself quite plain. I am aware that you want me to go home. You will do it far better, however. You, you will do far better, however, if you encourage me to stay until I have proved myself worthy of my reputation. No one was allowed to leave the theatre during his recitals, however pressing the reason, and the gates were kept barred. And this could go on for days while he was repeating and repeating his performance. We hear, Suetonius says, we hear of women in the audience giving birth 
and of men being so bored with the music and the applause that they furtively dropped down from the wall at the rear or shammed dead, pretended to be <laughs> pretended to be dead, to be carried away for burial. Nero's stage fright, this was a serious thing to him. He actually had stage fright. Um, and uh, he was generally, before the performance, very nervous. Um, so his stage frights and his, his general nervousness, his jealousy of rivals and his awe of the judges were more easily seen than believed. He treated his fellow competitors as though they were his equals. He was pretending all the time that he was actually entering a true competition and would, uh, would fuss over them and pay court to them and then abuse them behind their backs and sometimes insult them to their faces. If any were, for example, particularly good singers, he would bribe them not to do themselves justice so as to sing out of tune. And he would bribe them for that. And of course, you couldn't refuse. You'd be dead the next day. Before every performance, he would address the judges with the utmost deference. He had done what he could, you know, he said, and the issue was now and the judgment was now in fortune's hands. But since they were men of judgment and experience in life, they would know how to eliminate the factor of chance of not giving him the prize and they soon learn how to avoid that when they told him not to worry he felt a little better but was still anxious and mistook the silence of some for severity and the embarrassment of others he misunderstood that for mis disfavor admitting that he suspected every one of them he strictly observed the rules, never daring to clear his throat, for example, and never before starting to sing, okay? He would not, against the rules, clear his throat, and even using his arms to wipe the sweat from his brow, not allowed, didn't do it. Once, while acting in a tragedy, he dropped his scepter and quickly recovered it, but he was absolutely terrified of this qualification. The accompanist, however, sh uh, swore that uh, this slip had passed unnoticed. They, no one had noticed it and seen amid the audience. Um, so... Um, he, he and the audience afterwards started applauding so anyway he he was he was uh, he took that to heart again on several occasions he took part in the chariot racing and at olympia he drove a 10 horse team a novelty for which he had censured another king, King Mithridates, in one of his own poems. But in this particular case, he lost his balance, fell from the chariot, and had to be helped um, again to, to rise, to, to continue. But though he failed to stay the course and retired before he, the finish, the judges nevertheless awarded him the prize. And on the eve of his departure from that town, he presented the whole province with its freedom and conferred Roman citizenship as well as large cash awards on the judges who gave him the prize. Uh, when he came back to Rome, uh, victims were sacrificing his honor all along the route which was at the same time sprinkled with perfume. And the people showered him with songbirds and ribbons and sweetmeats as compliments on his voice. He hung the wreaths above the couches in his sleeping quarters and set up several statues of himself playing the lyre. And... Um, in order to save his voice, when he had to address the troops, he would do that in writing. He didn't want to, to strain it. Uh, 
Now, okay, let's get serious a little bit. His insolent, insolence, his lust, extravagance, greed and cruelty, he at first revealed only gradually and secret, secretly. And I'm going to tell you about the cruel, tremendous cruel acts that he did just for fun of it. Uh, he, re he revealed this part of his character gradually only and secretly at first uh, as though merely as, as though they were just um, youthful mistakes or youthful pranks playing on other people but even then there could be no doubt that these were the faults of his character not of his age for example, as soon as night fell, he would snatch a hat or cap and make a round of the taverns and, and prowl the streets in search of mischief. And not always innocent mischief either, because one of his games was to attack men on their way home from dinner, stab them, if they offered resistance, and then dropped their bodies down the sewers. He would also break into shops, afterwards opening um, a miniature market in his home with all the stolen goods that he had stolen from ordinary shops and dividing them into lots and then auctioning them himself and squandering the proceeds. During these escapades, he often risked being blinded or killed because that could have happened. He was disguised, after all. Once, in fact, he was beaten almost to death by a senator whose wives he had molested, which taught him never to go out after dark unless with an escort of military uh, tri uh, tri tribunes uh, unless they were following him at a discreet distance. He would also secretly visit the theatre by day in a sedan chair and watch the quarrels among the pantomime actors, cheering them on from the top of the, uh, the, the building. And then uh, when they came to blows and fought it out with stones and broken benches, he would take part on that and join them in the fun by throwing things on the heads of the crowd. There he was at the very top of the uh, theater, throwing benches and things onto the crowd. And on one occasion, he actually fractured a, uh, a senator's skull. Gradually, Nero's vices gained the upper hand. He no longer tried to laugh them off or hide or, hide or deny them, but actually turned quite brazen here. His feasts now lasted from noon till midnight with an, an occasional break for diving into a warm bath or, if it were summer, into a snow-cooled water. Sometimes he would drain the artificial lake in the campus marshes on the, uh, or the other in the, in, the, in the circus and hold public dinner parties there. And he would hold these dinner parties with prostitutes and dancing girls from all over the city serving as waitresses. Whenever he floated down the Tiber to Ostia or cruised past uh, Baie, he had a row of uh, temporary brothels erected along the shore where a number of noble women, pretending to be madams, stood waiting to solicit his business. He was actually forcing these noble women to do this. He also forced his friends to provide him with dinners. One of them spent four million surtices on a turban party and another even more on a rose banquet. Not satisfied with seducing um, freeborn boys and married women, Nero also raped the Vestal Virgin, Rubria. 
He nearly contrived to marry the free woman Acte, but by persuading some friends of consular rank to swear falsely that uh, she came of royal stock. Having tried to turn the boy, a young boy, Sporus, into a girl, uh, he tried to do that uh, by castration, um, but uh, didn't didn't do it he went through but nevertheless he went through a um wedding sem- ceremony with him w- uh, with dowry and a bridal veil and everything okay which the whole court attended and then brought him home and uh, says uh, suetonius um, treated him as a wife a rather amusing joke is still going the rounds, says Suetonius in the first century. The world would have been a happier place, people used to say, had Nero's father, Domitius, married that sort of wife. He dressed the boy Spor- Sporus in the fine clothes normally worn by an empress and t- took him in his own litter, not only to every Greek, uh, as is unfair, but eventually through the um, sigillaria at Rome, kissing him amorously now and then. Also... Okay, this is a boy, but also the passion he felt for his own mother, Agrippina, was notorious. But her enemies would not let him consummate this love, fearing that if he did, she would become even more powerful and ruthless than she already was. So he found a new mistress who was said to be her exact image, and some say that he did, in fact, commit incest with Agrippina every time that he rode, they rode together in the same litter. The state of his clothes when he came out was apparently uh, apparent uh, when he, Suetonius says, when he emerged. Uh, his clothes proved it. Nero was as prodigal with his own chastity as with that of the others, and after befouling every part of his body, he at last invented a noble game and attacked, this is uh, rather awful actually, attacked, um, he, uh, okay, this was a, a, a game that he invented. He would be released from a den, dressed in the skins of wild animals, and then went to attack the private parts of men and women who stood bound to stakes. And after working up sufficient excitement by these means, he was, Suetonius says, he was finished off, off, shall we say, by his freedman Doriforus. And Doriforus now married him. Now, <laughs> now Doriforus married him just as he himself had married Sporus. And on the wedding night, he, Nero, imitated the screams and moans of a girl being deflowered. According to my informants, says Suetonius, he was convinced that no one could remain sexually chaste or pure in any respect, but that most people actually concealed all their secret sexual vices. Everyone had them, and hence, if anyone confess to him his his, each person, uh, their obscene practices, Nero forgave him of all their other crimes and even taxes sometimes. He believed that also that fortunes were made to be squandered and whoever could keep track of his expenses seemed to him a stingy miser. True gentlemen, he said, always throw their money about. He professed deep admiration for his uncle, Gaius, merely because he had run through Tiberius's vast fortune and he never thought twice himself about giving away or wasting um, 
giving away money. Nero never wore the same clothes twice. He would stake 400,000 gold pieces on each pip of the winning throw at dice. And when he went fishing, he, he used a golden net strung with purple and scarlet thread. He seldom travelled, it is said, with a train of fewer than 1,000 carriages. The mules were shod with silver, the muleteers wore Canusian wool, and he was escorted by Massassian horsemen and outriders with jingling bracelets and medallions. Nero's confidence in the national resources was not the only cause of his furious spending. He had also been excited by tales of great hidden treasures vouched for by a Roman equus who swore that the hoard brought by Queen Dido to Carthage centuries before, when she fled from Tyre, still let, lay untouched in, in certain huge African caves and could easily be retrieved. And when, when his hopes failed to materialize, Nero found himself bankrupt, and his financial difficulties were such that he could not lay hands on enough money even for the soldiers' pay or the veterans' benefits, and he therefore resorted to robbery and blackmail. <laughs> First he made a law that if a, if a uh, freedman died um, who had uh, taken the name of family connected with his own and could not show adequate reason, five-sixths of the state, not merely one-half, should be forfeited to him. Next, he seized the states of those who had shown ingratitude by not bequeathing him enough that could be anybody, and find, the, uh, and find the legal specialists responsible for writing and dictating such wills. He took back the presents uh, he, had been, he had given to Greeks, uh, Greek cities in acknowledgement of prizes, won at a musical or athletic contest. On one market, market day, he sent an agent to sell a few ounces of amethystine and Tyrian, Tyr Tyrian purple dyes, which he had forbidden to be used. And then closed, the, and after he did that, he closed the business of the dealers who had bought them. It is said that he once noticed a lady wearing this illegal color at one of his recitals, pointed her out to his assistants and had her dragged off, whereupon she was stripped not only of her clothes but of her entire property. His invariable formula when he appointed a magistrate was, you know my needs, don't you? You and I must see that nobody is left with anything. Finally, he robbed numerous uh, temples of their treasures and melted down the gold and the silver images, among them the uh, household gods of Rome, which Galba, who was a general uh, in Spain, however, when he took over, he had recast, recast soon afterwards. Um, okay. He also tried to poison Britannicus, who was his stepbrother, no less because he was jealous of his voice, which was far more musical than his own, um, and also for fear that the common people might be less attached to Claudius' adopted son than to his real son. Uh, he was actually Claudius' son. Uh, so he, he, he actually poisoned him. The drug came from an expert poisoner named Lucasta. And when its actions were, they, she applied the poison. And when the result was not as rapid as he expected, 
the effect in this particular case she hadn't given him enough was uh, laxative more than anything. Uh, she, she didn't kill him. Um, he Nero called for her for the poisonous and uh, complaining that she had given him medicine instead of poison and actually beat her up with his own hands. Lacasta actually explained that she had only reduced the dose in order to make the crime less obvious. Very intelligent reply, true or not. But uh, she, had, she hadn't given him enough dose in order to make the crime less obvious. Oh, he said, so you think that I am afraid of the Julian law? And then he led Lucasta into his bedroom and stood over her while she concocted the fastest working poison in her pharmacia, I suppose. So this he admitted, he, in order to try it, he just took it and gave it to a kid. But when it took five hours, the kid, when it took five hours for him to die, he made her boil down the brew again and again and again. At last, he tried it on a pig, which died on the spot. And that night, at dinner, he had what remained poured into Britannicus' cup. And Britannicus dropped dead at the very first taste. But Nero lyingly assured the guest that the poor boy had long been subject to these epilept epileptic seizures. Britannicus was buried hastily and without ceremony on the following day during a, a heavy shower of rain and Nero granted Lucasta now in return for her services immunity and some quite sizable states and actually supplied her with students. Uh, the overwatchful, overcritical eye of her, of his mother Agrippina kept on whatever Nero said or did, and this proved more than he could stand now. He first tried to embarrass her by frequent threats to abdicate, I'll ab ab abdicate, he said, and go into retirement in Rhodes. Those were threats. Then, having deprived her, deprived her of all honor and power, and even of her Roman and German bodyguard, he expelled her from uh, the Palatine, after which he did everything possible to annoy her, sending people to pester her with lawsuits while she stayed in Rome, and when she took refuge uh, on her country states, making them constantly drive, he would make them constantly drive or sail past the windows, disturbing her with jeers and, and uh, catcalls. In the end, her threats and violent behavior terrified him into deciding that she actually must die. And he tried to poison her three times, but she had always taken the antidote in advance, so he rigged up a machine in the ceiling of her bedroom which would dislodge the panels and drop them on her while she slept. That is how she, he was going to kill her. However, someone gave the secret away, and then he had the collapsible cabin boat, this a collapsible cabin boat design which would either sink or fall <laughs> on top of her. Under the pretense of reconciliation, he sent the most friendly note inviting her to celebrate the Quincatrice with him at Baye, and on her arrival he made one of his captains stage an accidental collision with uh, the galley in which she had sailed 
and then he protracted the feast until a late hour and when at last she said you know I really must get back to Maoli he offered her his collapsible boat instead of the damaged galley Nero was in a very happy mood as he led Agrippina down to the quay and even kissed her breasts before she stepped aboard he sat up all night on tenterhooks, uh, tenterhooks of anxiety waiting for news of her death and at dawn Lucius Argemus her freedman, her freedman entered joyfully to report that although the ship had foundered his mother actually had swum to, sw to safety and that he need have no fears on her account she was uh, alive thank god for want of a better plan Nero ordered one of his men to drop a dagger surreptitiously beside Agermus this guy who came to tell him whom he arrested at once on a charge of attempted murder and after this he arranged for Agri Agrippina to be killed and made it seem as if she had sent Argemus to assassinate him but committed suicide on hearing that the plot had miscarried other more gruesome details are supplied by reliable authorities says the historian it appears that Nero rushed off to examine Agrippina's corpse uh, corpse, um, corpse sorry handling her legs and arms critically and between drinks discussing their good and bad points and though encouraged by the congratulations which poured in from the army and the senate and the people he was never thereafter able to free his conscience from the guilt of this crime don't know whether he had much of a conscience there I think we are beginning to see the beginning of you know insanity perhaps having disposed of his mother Nero proceeded to murder his aunt Domitia he found her confined to bed with severe constipation the old lady stroked his uh, downy beard affectionately he was already full grown and uh, uh, as, as, as she uh, caressed his beard she said whenever you celebrate your coming of age and present me with this the beard I shall die happy and so Nero turned to his courtiers and said laughingly in that case I must shave at once which he did and then he ordered the doctors to give her a laxative of fatal strength seized her property, property before she was quite dead and avoided all legal complications by tearing up the tearing up the will after octavia her his first wife he took two more wives first Popeye and uh, sabina uh, the daughter of a quester at that time married to an an equus and then another one Statilia Messalina the great great granddaughter of Augustus general Taurus who had been a consul and won a, a, a triumph to marry Statilia the second one he was obliged to murder her husband the consul um, Atticus Vestinus life with Octavia had soon bored him his first wife and when his friends criticized his treatment of her he retorted the title of wife ought surely to be enough for her he tried to strangle her on several occasions but finally announced that she was barren and divorced her this act made him so unpopular and caused so great scandal that he vanished Octavia and finally had her executed on a charge of adultery her innocence was proved by the refusal of the witnesses to testify against her even under torture so he bribed his old tutor to confess 
falsely that he had tricked her into infi uh, infidelity. Uh, he doted on Popeye, the other, uh, the, the other wife, whom he married twelve days after his divorce from Octavia, and he proceeded um, a little bit later to kick her to death while she was pregnant and feeling very ill. Because, why? Because she dared complain that he came home late from the races. Popaea had born him a daughter, Claudia Augusta, who died in infancy. There was no family relationship which Nero did not criminally abuse. When Claudius' daughter Antonia refused to take Popaea's place, he had her executed on a charge of attempted rebellion. He likewise destroyed every other member of his family, including relatives by marriage. Among them was young Aulus Plautius, whom he raped before having him put to death, remarking, Now mother may come and kiss my successor. He claimed that Agrippina had been in love with this Aulus and had induced him to make a bid for the throne. There was also his stepson, Rufius Crispinus, Pompeius' child, by her former husband. Nero had the, boy on uh, the boy's own slaves drown him on a fishing expedition simply because he was said to have played at being a general and an emperor was a child playing. He banished uh, Tuscus, the son of his wet nurse and now procurator of Egypt for daring to use the baths which he had built in preparation for Nero's visit to Alexandria. Um, he promised uh, Burrus, the Praetorian prefect, a cough uh, mixture <laughs> Uh, but sent poison instead, and he also poisoned the food and the drink of the rich old freedman who had originally arranged for him to be adopted as Claudius's heir, and when I now acting as his, as his advisers. Nero resolved on a wholesale massacre of the nobility. What fortified him in, his, in these decisions and seemed to justify it was that he had discovered two plots against his life. The earlier and more important of the two was the Bisonian conspiracy in Rome and the other was the Venetian conspiracy at Beneventum. When brought up for trial, the conspirators were loaded with three sets of chains some, while admitting their guilt, claimed that the only way they could help a man so thoroughly steeped in evil as Nero was to kill him. That was the only way out. All children of the condemned men were banished from Rome and then starved to death or poisoned. It is well known that a group of men were killed at a single lunch along with their tutors and attendants and that others were prevented from seeking sustenance. After this, nothing could restrain Nero from murdering anyone he pleased on whatever pretext. Those whom he ordered to commit suicide were never given more than an hour's grace. To ensure against delays, he made doctors take care of any who were found still alive, which in Nero's vocabulary meant opening their veins. He was eager, it is said, to get hold of a certain Egyptian, a sort of ogre who would eat raw flesh and practically anything else he was given and watch him tear live men to pieces and then devour them. 
these successes, as Nero called them, went to his head and he boasted that no previous ruler had ever realized the true extent of his power. Often he hinted broadly that it was not his intention to spare the remaining senators, but would one day wipe out the entire senatorial order and let the equites and freedmen govern the provinces and command the armies instead. Nero showed no uh, greater mercy to the common folk or to the very walls of Rome. Once, in the course of a general conversation, someone quoted the line, When I'm dead, may fire consume the earth. <clears throat> but Nero said that the first part of the line should read, While I yet live. And soon... <clears throat> converted this fancy into fact, pretended to be disgusted by the drab old buildings and narrow winding streets of Rome, he brazenly set fire to the city, and though a number of former consuls caught his attendants trespassing on their property with tow and blazing torches, they dared not interfere. He also coveted the sites of several granaries, solidly built in stone near the Golden House, and having knocked down their walls with siege engines, he set the interiors ablaze. This terror lasted for six days and seven nights, causing many people to take shelter in the tombs. Not only did a vast number of tenements burn down, but houses which had belonged to famous generals and were still decorated with their trophies, temples too dating back to the time of the uh, kinship, and others dedicated during the uh, uh, Punic and Gallic Wars. In fact, every ancient monument of historical interest that had here to survive. Nero watched the conflagration from the tower in the gardens of Messinas, enraptured by what he called the beauty of the flames, and then put on his tra tragedian's uh, actor's costume and sang then the fall of Troy, that is what he was singing, from beginning to end. He offered to remove corpses and rubble free of charge, but allowed nobody to search among the ruins, even of his own home. He wanted to collect as much loot as possible himself, and then he opened a fire relief fund and insisted on contributions which bled the provincials, uh, bled them dry, uh, and... Uh, that's a figure of speech, uh, uh, and, and practically beg at all private uh, uh, citizens. Um, amidst all this, it was strange and quite striking that there was nothing which Nero seemed, seemed to mind less than curses and insults, and that there was no one to whom he was more lenient, as a matter of fact, than those who attacked him in jokes and lampoons. Many things of this sort, in both Greek and Latin, were posted up on walls, making fun of him, um, and all passed from, from mouth to mouth. But amazingly, he never tried to trace the authors, and when an informer handed the Senate a short list of their names, he gave instructions, he, Nero, gave instructions that they should be left off lightly, and that was because they were in the, uh, in the theater. At last, after nearly 14 years of Nero's misrule, the earth rid herself of him, says the historian. The first move was made by the Gauls under Julius Vindex, that was his name, the Praetorian governor of that province. Um, Nero's astrologers had told him that he would one day be removed from public office and were given the famous reply, quote, a simple craft will keep a man from want. And these refer, doubtless in his mind, to his lyre playing, 
which although it might be only a pastime for him as an emperor would would have to support him if he were reduced to earning a livelihood some astrologers forecast that if forced to leave rome he would find another throne in the east and they actually suggested perhaps jerusalem <laughs> oh dear Nero heard of the Gallic revolt, revolt, this is the end now, he heard of the uh, French revolt on the anniversary of his mother's murder. He was in Neapolis at the time and took the news so phlegmatically that everyone diagnosed satisfaction at finding a good excuse to declare war on such rich provinces and strip them clean. He didn't seem to mind. Going straight to the gymnasium, he was soon engrossed in watching the athletic contests, and when a far more serious dispatch reached him at dinner time, he still showed no sign of disturbance beyond a threat to punish the rebels. In fact, for eight days, um, he wrote no orders and issued no special announcements, apparently trying to ignore the whole affair. At last, a series of insulting edits signed by Vindex himself must have made some impression on him. In a letter to the Senate, he urged them to avenge himself and the Commonwealth, but pleaded an infected throat as an excuse for not appearing in person in the Senate. When further urgent dispatches um, arrived in quick succession, he hurried back home in a state of terror. On the way, however, he happened to notice a group of monument of a, a sculpture which represented a beaten uh, Gaul, a, a French guy, uh, being dragged along head first by a mounted Roman, and this lucky sign he interpreted uh, sent him into a transport of joy and he lifted his hands in gratitude to heaven. When therefore he arrived in the city, he even neglected to address either the senate or the people. Instead, he summoned the leading citizens to his home, where, after a brief discussion of the Gallic situation, he devoted the remainder of the session to demonstrate it to them a water organ and explaining the mechanical complexities of several different models and he even remarked that he would have them installed in the theater and then sarcastically if of course if vindex had no objection but when news arrived of the revolt of galba and the spanish provinces he fainted dead away and remained mute and insensible for a long while now he's having from france and from spain so uh, coming to himself, he tore his clothes and beat his forehead, crying that all was now over. His old nurse tried to console him by pointing out that many rulers in the past had experienced similar setbacks, but Nero insisted that to lose the supreme power while still alive was something that had never happened to anyone else before. Yet he made not the slightest attempt to alter his lazy and extravagant life. On the contrary, he celebrated whatever good news came in from the provinces with the most lavish banquets imaginable and composed comic songs about the leaders of the revolt, which he set to bawdy tunes and sang with appropriate gestures. And these have since become popular favorites, says the historian. Then he stole into the theater and sent a message to an actor who was being loudly applauded that he was taking advantage of it, he, the, the, the actor who was applauded, he was taking advantage of him, Nero's absence. And so he, um, he had it killed. He had him killed. At first, 
At the first news of revolt, Nero is said to have formed several appalling though characteristic schemes for dealing with the situation. Thus he intended to recall all army commanders and provision, provision, provincial governors and execute them on charge of conspiracy and to slaughter all exiles everywhere for fear that they might join the rebels and all Gallic residents of Rome because they might be implicated in the rising. He further considered giving the army free permission to pillage the Gallic provinces, poisoning the entire senate at a banquet and setting fire to the city again, but first letting wild beasts loose in the streets to hinder the citizens from coping with the blaze. However, he had to abandon these schemes, not because he scrupled to carry them out, but because he realized their impracticality in view of the military campaign soon to be forced on him. So he dismissed the consuls from office before their term ended and took over both consulships himself, declaring that it stands to reason only a consul can subdue Gaul. But one day soon after, assuming the consular insignia, he left the dining room with his arms around two friends' shoulders and remarked that when he reached Gaul, he would at once step unarmed in front of the embattled enemy and weep and weep and weep before them. These would soften their hearts, he said, and, and win them back to loyalty to him and on the next day he would stroll among his joyful troops singing pens victory which he really ought to be composing now he says in his military preparations he was mainly concerned with finding enough wagons to carry his stage equipment and arranging for the concubines who who would accompany him to have male haircuts and be issued with Amazonian shields and axes. When this was settled, Nero called the Roman people to arms, but since not a single eligible recruit came forward, he forcibly enlisted a number of slaves, choosing the best from each household and refusing exemption even to stewards or secretaries. All classes had to pay an income tax and every tenant of a private house or flat was told that he owed a year's rent to the imperial exchequer. Nero insisted on being paid in none but newly minted coins or in silver and gold of high standard. Hence many people would not contribute anything protesting that he would do much better if he reclaimed the fees from his informers. Nero was now so universally uh, univers- uh, universally loathed, loathed that no abuse could be found bad enough for him. Insults were scrawled on columns everywhere about his... Uh, there were jokes actually saying that he he crowed uh, um, where is it about his crowing having aroused even the the cocks <laughs> all right so he's singing having aroused the uh, roosters yes and many people played the trick of pretending to have trouble with their slaves at night and shouting out vengeance is coming Ah, the implications of auspices, of omens, old and new, and of his own dreams began to terrify Nero now. In the past, he had never known what it was to dream, but after killing his mother, he dreamed that he was steering a ship and that someone tore the tiller from his hands. Next, his wife Octavia pulled him down into thick darkness, that was his dream, where hordes of winged ants swarmed over him. Then the statues of the nations, which had been dedicated 
in the theatre of Pompey began to hem him in and prevent him from getting away. While his favourite uh, Asturian horse uh, turned into an ape, or all except the head, which whined a tune. Oh my goodness! Again, while his speech against Vindex was being read in the Senate, a passage running, the criminals will soon incur the punishment and die the death that they so, they so thoroughly deserved. When he came to that passage, it was hailed on all sides uh, with cries of, Augustus, you will do so. People also noticed that Nero, at his last public appearance, sang the part of Oedipus in exile and ended with the line, Wife, mother, father, do my death compel. When a dispatch bringing the news that the other armies had also revolted was brought him, uh, to him at lunch, he tore it up pushed over the table and sent smashing to the ground two, two of these of his Homeric drinking cups, so-called Homeric because they were engraved with scenes from Homer. He made Lacasta give him some poison, which he put in a golden box, and then crossed to the Servilian gardens, where he tried to persuade the tribunes and centurions of the Praetorians to flee with him, um, because his most faithful freedman had gone ahead to equip a fleet at Ostia. Some answered evasively, evasively sorry, and uh, others flatly refused. One even shouted out the line, is it so terrible a thing to die? He had no one now. Nero had no idea what to do. A number of alternatives offered, for example, throwing himself on the mercy of the Parthians or of Galba, the, the generals, or appearing pathetically on the rostra to beg the people's pardon for his sins. They might at least he thought perhaps make him prefect in, in Egypt or give him some other office. That is what he thought. Uh, if they could not find it in their hearts to forgive him altogether. A speech to, the, to this effect was later found among, among the papers in his writing case. And the usual view is that the only fear of being torn to pieces before he reached the forum prevented him from delivering this speech. speech, speech. Nero suspended his deliberations until the following day, but woke at midnight to find that his bodyguard had deserted him. He leaped out of bed and summoned his friends. When they did not appear, he went with a few members of his staff to knock at their doors, but nobody either opened or answered. He returned to his room. By now even the servants have asconded with the bed leaning and the box of poison. He shouted for Spiculus the gladiator or any other trained executioner to end his misery at one blow but no one even came to do that. What, he said, have I then neither friends nor enemies? He cried and dashed out, apparently interned, intending to hurl himself into the Tiber. But he changed his mind once more, and he said that all he wanted was some secluded spot where he could collect his thoughts at leisure. And Phaon, an imperial freedman, suggested his own suburban, suburban villa four miles away between the Via Salaria and the Via Nomentana. 
Nero jumped at the offer. He was barefoot and wearing only a tunic, but he simply pulled on a faded cloak and a hat, took horse and trotted off, holding a handkerchief over his face. Only four companions went with him, including Sporus. Suddenly a slight earth tremor was felt and lightning flashed in their eyes, which terrified Nero. Then, from the nearby camp, he heard soldiers shouting about the defeat which Galba would inflict on him. He heard one man exclaim as they passed, Those fellows are in pursuit of Nero. And he heard another saying, What's the latest news of him in the city? Then Nero's horse took fright at the smell of a dead body lying by the roadside, which made him expose his face. He was immediately recognized and saluted, actually, by a Praetorian veteran. They reached the lane leading to Feon's villa and, abandoning their horses, followed a path which ran through a briar patch and a plantation of reeds to the rear wall of the house. Because the going was difficult, Nero made them spread a cloak for him to walk on. When begged by Phaon to lie low for a while in a gravel pit, he answered, No, I refuse to go underground before I die. While the servants tunneled through the wall, he scooped up some water in his hands from a neighboring pool and drank it, saying, This is Nero's own special brew. Then he pulled out all the thorns from his ragged cloaked cloak and crawled into the villa by way of the tunnel. Finding himself in a slave's bedroom, beside a couch with a poor mattress, over which an old cape had been thrown, he sank down on it and, although hungry, refused some coarse bread, but he confessed himself still thirsty and sipped a little warm water. Finally, when his companions unanimously insisted on his trying to escape from the miserable fate threatening him, he ordered them to dig a grave at once on the right size for his, uh, on, on, of the right size for his body, and then collect any pieces of marble that they could find and fetch wood and water for the disposal of the corpse. As they bustled about obediently, he muttered through his tears, Dead and so great an artist. A runner brought a letter to Phaon. Nero tore it from the man's hands and read that, having been declared a public enemy by the Senate, he would be punished in ancient style when arrested. He asked what that ancient style meant and learned that the executioners stripped their victims naked, thrust his head, they would thrust his head into a wooden fork and then flogged him to death with sticks. In terror, he snatched up the two daggers which he had brought along and tried their points, but threw them down again, protesting that the fatal hour had not yet come. Then he begged Spurs to weep and mourn for him, and also begged one of them to set him as an example by committing suicide first. He kept moaning about his cowardice and muttering, how ugly and vulgar my life has become. This is certainly not fitting for Nero, not fitting at all. I have to keep a stiff upper lip in all this. Come, pull yourself together. By this time, the troop of cavalry who had orders to take him alive were coming up the road. Nero gasped, hark to the sound I hear. It is hooves of galloping horses. And then, with the help of his secretary, Epaphroditus, he stabbed himself in the throat and was already half dead when a cavalry officer entered, pretending to have rushed to his rescue and staunched 
the wound with his cloak. Nero muttered, too late, but ah, what fidelity. So speaking, he died with eyes glazed and bulging from their sockets, a sight which horrified everyone present. He had made his companions promise, whatever happened, not to let his head be cut off, but to have him buried all in one piece. Galva's freedman, Isilus, who had been imprisoned when the first news came of the revolt and was now at liberty again, granted this indulgence. They laid Nero on his pyre, dressed in the gold-embroidered white robes which he had worn on the calends of January. The funeral cost two million surstices, and so on. Okay. And so he died. My goodness, so... And so Nero died at the age of 32 on the anniversary of Octavia's murder. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.